Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the LSE. Welcome to this forum event on the minds of birds. Uh, the questions we'll be discussing in this event are, what is it like to be a bird? How do they think? How do they feel? What can we learn from comparative psychology about the intelligence of birds? And also, what can we learn from our encounters with birds, about the birds and about ourselves? And I'm delighted to be joined by two experts who've approached these questions from completely different directions and, and have really fascinating insights to bring to bear on them. I mean, they are Professor Nikki Clayton, uh, Professor of Comparative Psychology at the University of Cambridge and also scientist in residence at Ballet Romba and uh, author and uh, writer of creative nonfiction and naturalist Mark Cocker, uh, author of books including Birds Britannica and Claxton, Birds and People and Crow Country, uh, shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize in 2008. I noticed there's now a vintage classics edition yeah. of Crow Country, uh, the modern classic in this area. Um, so to give you a sense of the format for the event, I mean, we'll focus in the first 45 minutes, broadly speaking, on Nikki's work, approaching these questions from a scientific direction. And then in the second half, we'll turn to Mark's work, thinking about the relations between birds and people and what we can learn from those <coughs> encounters. So to start with Nikki, I mean, you're a world expert in avian cognition. I mean, I guess at least before you started working in this area, avian cognition was not particularly a, a well-known field. People think of birds as being stupid. They think of birds as not being the sort of things to have intelligence and cognition. How did you come to this topic? How did you change the way we think about these things? Well, I've always wanted to be a bird. Sadly, I'm not one, but I don't know if you can see my invisible wings. They're shimmering and shining right now. And in fact, it's my love of birds that got me both into science and into dance, because I wanted to fly. And I don't mean get in an aeroplane and take off. I wanted to fly myself with my invisible wings. And that started my love of ballet and then later other forms of dance. But it also informed my science. In fact, when I went to university, I really wanted to do a joint degree in psychology and zoology. But Oxford didn't do a joint degree in that. I could have done psychology with philosophy, which sounded like a lot of fun. And I could have done zoology. And I really wasn't sure which one to pick. And at my interview at Pembroke College, one of the people that was interviewing me, Lord Krebs, said to me, well, if you pick zoology, you'll get me, but more importantly, you can do a research project on birds. And that instantaneously made <laughs> up my decision. Um, so I've always been fascinated by birds, I've wondered what it's like to be a bird, how can I ever know? Mm. We all know the, what is it like to be a bat philosophy. But I've always been absolutely fascinated by their behaviours and what mm. lies beneath that beady eye. Could you give us a, a sense of some of the experiments you've done and some of the things you've found out through those experiments? Well, I, as an undergraduate at Oxford, I began my first experiment on birds, and that was working with a little titmouse called the marsh tit. And marsh tits hide seeds. We call it caching. And at the time I was doing these experiments, they just discovered that these birds relied on memory to recover their caches. At that time, people had previously assumed that because of the sheer numbers, the thousands of seeds that a marsh tit hides over the autumn and winter months, they couldn't possibly be remembering. They must just be refinding them just by chance. And it had just been discovered that, no, that wasn't the case. They had remarkable memories. In fact, it was my mentor, John Krebs, and his students that had made these discoveries. And in one of the very ingenious experiments that they did, that I don't think we'd be allowed to do it these days in, 
interestingly, but they had little sunflower seeds which were radioactively labelled and then a radioactive Geiger counter to detect where the seeds were. And they were able to show that the birds only recovered those seeds that they themselves had cached. They had little leg rings on also that were tanned, so you knew which bird had recovered which radioactively labelled seed. And they found that even seeds placed as close as five centimetres next to the seed the bird had hidden weren't recovered, so the birds weren't searching at random. Anyway, they did lots more experiments on that, and my undergraduate project um, in the final year of my degree looked at memory interference. So even though I was in a zoology department, I was still doing very psychologically informed zoology, if you like, and I was interested in whether the birds would have more interference and therefore poorer memories if they'd stored a lot of seeds than if they'd stored only a few. So they either got five seeds to hoard or 80 seeds to hoard. And actually I found no evidence that there was any difference in their memories. Their mem memories were about 90% accurate, irrespective of how many seeds. And at the time, I, I thought that was amazing. And later, I discovered that other researchers in America had been looking at memory in the corvids, the members of the crow family that includes the ravens, the nutcrackers, the magpies, the jays, the jackdaws, to name a few of them. Mm. And they'd been doing studies with nutcrackers. And they wanted to know how long a nutcracker could remember for. So they started with intervals. Could they remember for a day? Yes, 100% accurate. Could they remember for a week? Ditto. Could they remember for a year? Ditto. And they actually went on to, to show that they were, there was no evidence of any forgetting whatsoever over intervals as long as 285 days. They didn't do further intervals. So that was the maximum they did. And, and people were just blown away by how remarkable their memories were. So that was the start mm. of it for me, really. And that, so that's about memory, right? That's about sort of looking backwards, remembering the past, and finding out that these, these birds can remember where they put the seeds almost a year ago. What about the future? What about planning? Well, when I started this work, all the emphasis was on spatial memory. And that very influential <laughs> book had just come out called The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map by Nobel Prize winning John O'Keefe and his dear friend, um, American psychologist Lynn Nadell. But I'm no good at spatial memory. I have no idea where North is. And if you asked me to retrace my steps to the green room right now, I would have no clue where I'm going whatsoever. And as for where the entrance to the building is, I have no idea. You don't want to be reincarnated then as a nutcracker. <laughs> yeah, or maybe a scrub jay, because they're prettier. <laughs> <laughs> and more dainty. But nutcrackers, don't they hide 100,000 seeds? 33,000. 33,000. Yeah, isn't that incredible? Yeah. yeah. So everybody had been emphasising spatial memory, and I, I was interested in looking at whether they could remember more than just where they'd mm. hidden their stashes of food. And in my first permanent position, which was in Davis in California, there were scrub jays all over campus, and these corvids are really friendly and very feisty and very noisy. And I just had a sense from watching them just intuitively that they must be very smart. I remember watching this cat that had the misfortune to approach this group of scrub jays a bit too closely. And just six of them just attack, attacked it. And it just, it was like shish kebab, you know, it just ran off terrified. And at that point, my interest was piqued because you don't normally see birds making mincemeat out of cats. It's normally the other way around. So I was really intrigued at just how feisty they were. And so I started studying them and realised that they, they, they would constantly watch where one another were caching and also hide lots of different foods. Mm. And that led to experiments showing that they could remember not only where they'd cached, but also what they'd hidden where and how long ago. Mm. And also who was watching. And in fact, probably the first experiment I did on their ability to remember the future, I did with my husband, Nathan Emery, who's sitting there at the front in the audience. And what we noticed was that these birds would, when other birds were around, they would rapidly stash or cash or hide the food. I'm using those words interchangeably. And then when the other birds had flown off, they would come back 
and move their cash to a new place. <laughs> and I thought, what? They're supposed to be long-term hoarders. You know, all the literature says that they cash for weeks, if not months and at a time. Why the heck are they moving them within literally a couple of minutes? And then an idea struck me and I thought, hmm, it's always when the other birds have left the scene. Are they actually moving them to new places so that the onlookers would no longer know where they are? Because about a third of their caches are stolen by other individuals. So cash theft is a real thing. And a lot of the other individuals that are doing the stealing are the other pesky scrub jays that are <coughs> watching. So I thought, oh, is this actually a cash protection tactic? So based on this observation, Nathan Emery and I designed a series of experiments to test whether that might be the case. So we had birds that were either observed by another bird that was either um, a bird that might steal their caches or they were observed by their mate with whom they share their caches or they cached in private. And what we found is that they only re-hid, so recovered and re-hid to new places, those seeds that a threatening observer had seen them cash. Mm. If their mate was watching or if they cashed in private, they just left the caches where they were. So it seemed that that was consistent with the idea that this mm. was a cash protection tactic as they were only doing if they'd been observed. But the really dramatic finding, and probably the reason why the paper got published in Nature, was that not all scrub jays did this. It was only those birds who had been experienced thieves in the past. Naive birds mm. who'd maybe seen others cashing but had never had their own experience of stealing caches didn't do it. In short, it takes a thief to know a thief. And of course, <laughs> the only point of recaching is if you have some sense of the future. If you mm. were stuck in the present, presumably those thoughts would never come to you. Yeah. And you, you refer to this as, as mental time travel sometimes. That's right. So there was a, a one... Does, any, does anybody in the audience know the lovely Robbie Burns poem, Ode to a Mouse? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in, this, in, the, in the lament, Robbie Burns, it's dusk, and he's just ploughed through a mouse's nest. And he feels riddled with guilt, thinking that because of his clumsy actions, this mouse isn't <coughs> going to make it through the night, it's going to die. And then a thought pops into his head, and he consoles himself and turns to the mouse and says, Still, thou art blessed compared with me. The present only touches thee. But oh, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forwards that I cannot see, I guess in fear. So he thought that mice, and presumably other animals, were stuck in time. And we now know that at least for some animals, notably the great apes and the mm. corvids, that this is not the case. They can plan for the future. And this you know, leads on to the question about the similarities, differences between corvids and, and apes. Right? So, we normally assume it must be the case that apes are more intelligent. Your work maybe casts some doubt on that. What do, what do you think? Are corvids as intelligent as apes? Yes, indeed. In fact, my husband, Nathan, co coined the term feathered ape to get across mm. the idea that the corvids are just as intelligent as the great apes. And we published a review paper in Science arguing the case that intelligence had evolved independently in these very distantly related groups of animals. So we were not saying that all animals are equally intelligent. We were saying that the corvids in particular, mm. and also probably the parrots, were on a par with the great apes. And some other mammals as well, dolphins and elephants, mm. would be classic examples. What about human children? <laughs> can, you yes. say, you know, can you say a sort of age at which a child becomes as intelligent as a, well, as a crow? It, it depends on the tasks that we've done. So mm. we have actually done tasks where we've compared young children and adult corvids, and you might say, well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? Shouldn't you be comparing young corvids and young children, not adults? But what we were interested in, of course, is the more philosophical question of, mm. is it possible to think without language? And if so, what's it like in non-linguistic animals, like the corvids, and what's mm. it like in pre linguistic subjects like children. And I'm always leery of saying a 
crow is like a four-year-old child or an eight-year-old mm. child or whatever, because a crow is not like a four-year-old ch child. You know, children have hands, birds have wings, mm -hmm. tri trivial morphological differences, but there's so many differences between them. Nonetheless, I think what is interesting is to look at the cognitive milestones and ask whether mm. the pattern of similarities and differences that you get between the children and the corvids and in the various tasks, what that might tell you about how complex some of these tasks are. So, for example, with, the, um, with some of the work on social cognition, like the experience projection and thinking about what another is thinking, children develop that, don't develop that until they're about age four. And there's a sort of a typical trajectory that on most mm. tests of what's called theory of mind, children age three fail. Children at age four start passing, and by five, they're reasonably good. And you see a similar developmental trajectory with mental time mm. travel. And yet there are other tasks we've done which, to, me, to my mind, intuitively seem much simpler. Physical tests of cognition, of understanding how to use a tool or what a tool does in a task, that the children aren't passing till they're eight years of age. So mm. that then tells us something interesting, that for whatever reason, they're finding those tasks more difficult. So that's the kind of mm. It experiment. raises this sort of question of anthropomorphism, right? That in, you have a famous paper where you talk about episodic-like memory, as if to say, well, it's kind of like um, what we call episodic memory in humans, where we have a, a memory of a particular episode. But it's like you want, to, you, you want to step back a bit from saying it is that. It's just something that is like that. Yes, now that's because as a scientist, of course, one's got to be very careful about what one has shown. It's one thing mm. to say I have an intuitive sense that scrub jays are very clever because they attack cats and they do all these cool things that if mm. a human were doing it is clever. The question is, are they doing it using a mechanism that is clever, like thinking, mm. for example? So the argument we made and the reason why we call this ability to remember what happened where and when as episodic-like memory is because in, in the psychological and neuroscientific literature, episodic memory in humans is defined as the subjective experience mm. of recollecting what happened where and when. And it's thought to be accompanied by two special kinds of consciousness. One is an awareness of the passage of time. So I can be aware that although I'm having thoughts in the moment, they're informed by thoughts of the past and they will also be informed by thoughts of the future. And the second is that I'm very much aware that I've made those memories. I'm the owner mm. and the author of the memory. And in the absence of any agreed behavioural criteria in non-linguistic creatures, I don't know how mm. we could test whether their memory of what happened where and when was accompanied by this awareness mm. of the passage of time and this particular mm. kind of self-awareness about being the author of a memory. And what's your hunch? I mean, so accepting this point that the scientific evidence doesn't conclusively establish that these birds have a subjective experience of a past event, do you, do you, is your sense that they do? My sense is that they do, yes. And that's not because they remember what, where, when, but it's because mm. they, they're so good at planning for the future mm. and they do so, when it comes to social cognition, they, they just seem so impressive. And I, I can't imagine how, without a sense of the passage of time mm. and a sense of at least some differentiation of self versus other, they'd be capable yeah. of doing these kinds of things, like the experiment I just told you where essentially it takes a thief to know a thief. I think mm. without some sort of understanding of that kind of experience projection, they wouldn't be able to do it. So. My argument is not based on a single experiment, but rather converging evidence to bear on a problem. Mm. What philosophers sometimes call an inference to the best explanation. Right? Exactly. It's not that. a sort of deductive proof, but there's several lines of evidence that would be explained by yes. the birds having a subjective experience. Yes. Of kind of like the all, all roads passing. lead to Rome. Yeah, great. And can I just also just ask about your kind of personal relationships with these birds? So, you know, in some cases, these must be birds that you've worked with over perhaps decades? Yes, definitely, yes. So do you, 
and, and, and you've said, you know, you think they have experience of the world like we do. Does this lead to a kind of well, personal bond with these animals? Oh, totally. They're very interactive. They, um, they recognise individual humans. Um, that's been shown in experiments in North America, actually, on crows. Um, but our jays also recognise individuals. They have some that they like more than others. Um, they hate one of the um, ex-technicians. Um, he was very big. Is that why they're an ex technician? <laughs> to be fair, he retired, but um, <laughs> they don't like big men who make big, clunky movements, have mm. low, loud voices, and they despise men with white hair with beards. <laughs> so, if you want to work in my lab and you have white hair and you're male, the only way you'll be allowed in is if you shave your beard. It's non negotiable. You can go at that later. <laughs> Sorry. The, the, the white is in the wrong place. If you're a Eurasian J, you have a beautiful white bottom and you love showing off your white bum patch, and they get very disturbed by people that have white in the wrong place. It's, it's just wrong. Mm. So you could wear it as a tail on the back, but not mm. here. I mean, let's bring Mark in on this, if we... Right. I mean, you must well, have you questions for Nikki. Um, well, what was I going to ask? Um, no, nothing at this stage, actually. Nothing that comes to mind, but... Uh... <laughs> so they all know their names, and I, they live in big aviaries. They're about 30 metre long aviaries. Mm. And there's testing chambers at the end. And they c come to their name. So we don't go with a net and try and catch them or do anything horrible. If I want Romero in, that's one of the nicest looking jays. He's the one that you always see on television because he's a bit of a star and he, he likes the cameraman and um, mm. he's very good looking. And if I want him into the testing compartment, I just shout, Romero, Romy, and in he comes. So they recognise their names and they recognise yeah. you, you think, oh, as totally. an individual. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, they are very naughty. Now, my mother was a school teacher, and she always reckoned that the naughty children were always the bright ones. Mm -hmm. And the Jays are very naughty. And I got into great trouble early on in my career because um, with one of the, the head female technician, actually, and she took her wedding ring off to wash her hands, and one of the Jays got out of the cage and stole her wedding ring. And she'd only just got married a few weeks before. And it took several months before the Jay would um, recover the cash and allow her to retrieve her wedding ring. Is, is that, is that behaviour only found in captive corvids? Or is it a, or is it a, or is it a, a characteristic of young birds or, because I mean, all, all the associations with magpies are that they, that they um, steal money and things like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, my, um, Tim Burkett, who's a mutual yes, friend of ours, right. says that um, it's only a learned behaviour in captive birds, that they only acquire this. But, I, but I've had loads of... I mean, one was a, um, a piece that I got in Birds and People, I think, where um, a guy <coughs> was leaving money for the milkman, and it was, van it was you know, left with the, on, yeah. under, the, under a yeah. pot, and the and magpies were stealing it. And... and um, <laughs> I, I've always assumed that it was captive magpies that have kind of become attracted by human artefacts. Do you think? Do you think wild birds could do it? I suspect some wild birds would do it as well. I think anything that attracts their attention. So I think it's a myth that they catch specifically shiny objects. However, I think anything that you know glints in the sunlight mm -hmm. uh, that they just mm -hmm. happen to therefore be more likely mm -hmm. to notice it mm -hmm. is going to be stolen. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there are all these reports of crows mm -hmm. gift giving where they actually bring money to money or, or, or pre yeah. presents of some form. I mean, yeah. whether they're presents you want <laughs> is another matter. Yeah, but, I remember know. the story now. It was. Um, that um, a guy had used an old silver cup to keep to put the money in and put it on top of you know for the milkman, and then when they came out, the silver cup had vanished, and the person <laughs> that assumed it was the milkman was dishonest, and um, and just put it down to bad luck, you know that he trusted the milkman, and you know you can't get a decent milkman these days, and um, <laughs> and then the nest blew down, and the milk and this cup fell out of the nest tree. 
<laughs> um, so that was interesting, you know. Yeah. And, and but as I say, I'd always assumed that it was because, of course, corvids were very widely kept as pets, and that caching behaviour, mm -hmm. stealing rings and things, would have been the sort of place where they would have picked up that folklore. And I just wondered if wild birds would do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's quite, it, it's quite interesting, and you mm. see more and more that corvids encroaching in our gardens mm. and in supermarkets mm. and. They're having to sort of adapt and urbanise. Well, there's this wonderful story of there are rooks on the memory service station on the M4, and they raid the rubbish bins at the motorway service station. So they, it's it's very very cool when you see it because um, usually they've seen it. Vicky? Uh, we've actually seen it. Nathan mm. and I have mm. been to the M4. In fact, it. it tried to disown me because I'm vegetarian and I have been since I was um, 11 and I actually went into a shop and bought a pork pie and he's looking at me going, what? You've not eaten meat since you're 11? How, how, what are you doing? And of course I, I bought it to feed the rooks because I know that they really like pork pie. And so we were placing <laughs> some bits into the bin so that we hope that we see how, them in action. How do you know they like pork pie? Because you feed it to them. Because we feed yeah, them yeah. little bits of it, because it's not very good for them, but we do feed them little bits of it. Because <laughs> e every Christmas at Maddingley, where we keep the birds, we, there's always a Christmas party, and it's one of these potlucks where everybody, students, technicians, staff, every, everybody just brings something nice to share. And there's always far too much food. There's always loads of food left over. And obviously, it's then cashed for the PhD students to have lunches for the rest of the week before they go home for Christmas. But there's always, always a load of perishable stuff that isn't going to keep anyway. And so we used to give some of the pork pies and the little, <coughs> is it, they called piglets wrapped in bacon or something, those oh, yes, sausages yeah, 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 in yeah, bacon, yeah. Yeah. things like that. And we'd give those to the rooks and they would a absolutely love them. They're not very good for them, so, but you know, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they know it's the festive season. <laughs> they do now. <laughs> so uh, we stuck some in the bin, and then sure enough, these birds came down, and you would s you'd see two of them perch at either end of the bin, and they'd be using the bin liner like a tool, and it would take them about 20 poles to get up the bin liner to a level where they could reach the food. And then rather than just grabbing a piece and flying off, they'd start tossing it over the side and then once they started getting a good pile and one bird had a sort of good command of it the other one would fly down and protect the food from other foragers that might be just happen something trying like a wagtail or a spa house sparrow or something that was picking up because there are all kinds of interesting things on the floor so I, I always thought of it as on the one hand it's tools because they're using the bin liner as a tool mm. to get food that they otherwise couldn't reach. Um, it's time, because it's not just one action and gets rewarded, they're having to do at least 20 actions before they get the first piece of, of food, first food reward. And it's teamwork, because they're mm. operating in tandem. I suspect so, mm. I mean we didn't know because mm. they're wild birds, mm. but they, they, as you know, rooks usually pair for life mm. and they're, they're when you see them in the wild, you can see if there's two sitting next to one another mm -hmm. or in very close proximity, mm -hmm. they're invariably a pair. Mm -hmm. And if they're much more distantly related, they're invariably, mm -hmm. you know, part of the same group, but not the pair. Mm. So, can I yeah. pick up on this idea of tool use? Right, because tool use is something we, we we used to think was uniquely human, and then we found out oh, chimpanzees can do it as well. And sometimes you still hear the idea that it's just humans <coughs> and apes, but corvids. Uh, tool use is a very important part of their whole uh, way of life, isn't it? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's been so many changes, really, since about, in terms of what we know about bird cognition, really, I would say, it, it's a relatively new field that most of the major discoveries, discoveries have been made since about 19, early 1990s. Mm. And in fact, since you came on the scene, basically. Well, not, not, not just me. Um, there was a, a, a chap called Gavin Hunt in New Zealand, and he discovered crow tool use. And on the island of New Caledonia, he discovered that there were these rather funny shaped pandanus leaves. 
And these leaves were funny because they were normal pandanus leaves, but they had bits cut out of them. It was like doily patterns. You know, it didn't look like random bits that something had been nibbling away at it. It looked like a sort of shape had been cut out. And they, they couldn't understand who was doing this and why it was being done. But he figured out that it was crows. Funnily enough, the New Caledonian crows that live on New Caledonia are called mm. New Caledonian crows. And they were cutting out these, these shapes from the leaf and using them as tools. And in different parts of the island, they do it in different ways, even though it's the same shaped leaves. Mm -hmm. So it was an idea that just as with chimpanzees, this could be so, a form of mm -hmm. culture that mm -hmm. it's learned. Mm -hmm. And so in some places they have thin ones, and in other places they have thick ones. And some of them kind of have a step shape that so sort of looks a bit, a bit like that sort of thing, if you imagine that. And some of them have just two steps in, and some of them have three steps, and some of them have four steps, and so on and so forth. So that was really the first discovery of it. And of course, that was published in Nature and it and was a really big discovery because this was the first finding that an, an animal other than a chimpanzee didn't just use tools but actually manufactured tools, actually did fashion them into particular shapes, used different tools for different things. So for example, in addition to these leaf tools, they have stick tools and some of them are straight and some of them have little hooks or kinks on the end. So that was the first discovery. And then the next really big discovery was made by Nathan Emery and his P then PhD student, Chris Bird. And I have to say that the journalists had a field day because we had two students. We had Christopher Bird and we had Amanda Seed. So you can imagine <laughs> Bird and Seed, people were just, you know, it was great. And they were all published on, on Clever Corvids. Anyway, what Chris Bird and Nathan Emery discovered was that in the lab, our rooks would spontaneously make tools. We'd been giving them physical cognition tasks, and we'd been inserting a stick, thinking that they, they're not tool users. Of course they won't spontaneously pick do, up, anything. do anything interesting. Mm -hmm. So we'll stick, a, stick in and see if they'll, they'll pull it out. But the birds taught, taught us less, and they showed us that actually, no, although they don't use tools in the wild, probably because the foods they eat don't require a tool. Mm -hmm. In the lab, if you give them a problem that requires a tool, they'll happily use one, they'll happily make one. And Chris and Nathan showed that the rooks were, they were taking pieces of wire and bending it into a hook, like the famous New Caledonian crows, that they were using various stick tools, that they were modifying them and bending them into shapes. Mm -hmm. And that they were really, really good tool users. And since then, we've also found that the Eurasian jays will do it as well. Don't they have a two-stage two tool manufacturing process which even exceeds the New Caledonian crows? Is that right? Is that the thing that you did with, with Chris Packer? Um, oh, the, well, we did a number of things. So, so there's one thing where they can use one tool to get another tool. Yes, that's it. Two tools. Mm. Yes. So it's one a tool sequential... Yeah, tool, yeah. Tool, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they can use a stick, say, to get a stone, or yeah. use a big stone to get a little stone, or mm -hmm. the vice versa. So, you, yeah, you're absolutely right, yeah. I mean, one question that does occur to me, and I, I'm slightly embarrassed in front of Nathan, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, one of the interesting things about primatology is that um, women have been very successful uh, studiers of primates, somehow, you know, more able to achieve a kind of intimacy with wild, theoretically dangerous primates. But I just wondered if, if there was something about, you know, being female has helped you to kind of, you know, achieve the same kinds of outcomes. And I know Nathan has played a big role in this, but, but, but do you think there's yeah, any, any, I, I, any difference in gender? If they don't like big men... <laughs> yeah. um, Mm. The, I mean, I've had, a couple, I've had a couple of males. <laughs> yeah. Just don't work with Jays. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had some male PhD students who've done very well. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had other male students who have found it very hard to mm -hmm. work with the birds. And I think one of the things they really like is they like little people mm. with delicate movements. Mm. And they also like high-pitched voices. Mm. So you, you might have noticed, I didn't say Romero, come in. <laughs> I said Romero, 
and those kind of singing. And what one of my PhD students, Lucy Cheek, she's now a lecturer in the department, would do is, is she, she's a very good whistler. Mm -hmm. And they love whistling. So all those high-pitched noises, mm -hmm. I think, help. And it's easier to make high-pitched mm -hmm. noises if you're little and female. I remember one time that we often have difficulty when camera crews come to film because the birds, although they're very friendly, they don't like new things and it takes them a while to get used to both people and objects and cameramen and their equipment in particular, um, particularly the sound mic, which is always hovered overhead and of course what the cameramen so often don't realise unless they're natural history photographers is that that's essentially like a bird of prey. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, then the bird's going to be freaked mm -hmm. out and not mm -hmm. behave naturally. And the easiest time of filming was one time when I was working um, at Rombert, formerly Ballet Rombert, and, and um, one of the dancers came to do some filming. And the birds were just good as gold and the filming was just so easy. And of course the thing about dancers is A, they tend to be small and slim, and mm. but also they have very graceful efforts. Mm. effortless movements mm. and it's not the speed actually if you you, you, uh, you can move very quickly and that doesn't disturb the birds but it's the kind of staccato clunky movements mm. that they don't like mm. so the daintier you are mm. the easier it is to work mm. with them I but think. The, the, the woman who did all the work with Alex the parrot what was her name um, Irene Pe Pepperberg. Pe Pepperberg yes I mean and also that sort of very early work that was done in the 50s by, do you, do you know the woman who kept great, great tits and blue tits and looked at their behaviour in their own house? Yes, um, um, Vance, yeah, what was it? No, no, not that. She wrote several books about the birds that were, that she, more or less, I mean, they were wild birds, but she would invite them into the house and feed them and was one of the first people to sort of start to look at behaviour very closely in the tits. I can't remember her name, but it just seemed... That's the birds as individuals. Yes, what was her name? No, that's right. Birds as individuals. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I think but it, it was, was so it was kind of seeing birds mm -hmm. as individuals and seeing their personalities and having yes. a kind of sensitivity, you know. So yes. I just wondered if women were better yeah. at this. It would be great, I think, to take some questions from the audience, actually. Um, there's a roving mic, so please do wait for the microphone to come to you so that we can capture your question and all hear it. But what would be great is to perhaps take three questions... Uh, in quick succession and then, then bring it back to Nikki. So there's one just at the end of the, is it sixth or seventh row there, just at the end? I was really excited when this talk came up because I just that week had a question about bird looking at them. Um, and I was looking out my window at, at birds kind of, I guess, swirl, swirling around with the wind. And one of my thoughts was, it, do they enjoy flying? Because I think as a human, that's something that I really envy, not being able to. And, and looking at them, they weren't going from A to B, and so my question was, you know, is it something they do for pleasure? Do they, do they enjoy flying? Do they play? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, there is a programme coming out um, with Chris, that I did with Chris Packham on December the 22nd, I don't know what time yet. Called, is it called Winter's Weirdest Events? I think it's a special edition. Mm. And there's about a five minute clip on that very question. And they're focusing on Corvid's playing. And um, the main one they're focusing on is, and it's all over YouTube. I'm, I'm surprised they've chosen to do it now because it's not brand new. Um, you can easily find it on YouTube. But these are um, hooded crows. I think it was a rig originally it was in Russia. And what the crow does is it takes a piece of white plastic on a rooftop covered with snow and it perches on top. And it's essentially snowboarding. Sliding down. <laughs> snowboarding hooded crow style. And you, you watch it doing it repeatedly and it sl slides down to the bottom of the rooftop, picks up the piece of plastic, hops up back up to the top and does it again. And it does it in succession a number of times. And it, it's hard to think of it as being anything other than play. I mean, it really does look just for fun. There's, there's no food involved or anything else. And you can see it's trying out the best spots. So there's one bit with lots of snow and that works really well. And then there's another bit where there isn't some, there's a bear patch in between the snow and that mm. doesn't work as well. And um, a sheer happenstance, the morning before this filming um, took, took place, 
I had a phone call from the Cambridge Evening News um, from one of the reporters who said, Dan, I wanted to ask you something about crows. I said, oh yes, yeah, shoot ahead. She said, I'm, I'm glad you get those sorts of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you get loads oh, of God, these here's as well. Another. <laughs> here's another, I thought, here's coming. She said, yeah, um, there's a pair of crows on top of our office building. I said, yes, thinking, well, you know. Great, yes. <laughs> what's, new, what's newsworthy about that? And she said, well, they're bouncing golf balls. Oh, my God. And apparently they were bouncing them and catching them. Bouncing them and catching them. Wow. So I sent the film crew to off there, so I don't know whether they mm. filmed. I wonder if I could answer that question also, because I looked at Rook's um, uh, roosting behaviours. And I have, uh, just across the river from where I live in Norfolk, a very large corvid roost, probably the largest in Britain, um, about 40,000 birds at its maximum. It's an astonishing sight. I really recommend you go and see it. But one of the things that I find fascinating about it is um, certain, certain background conditions trigger certain behaviours. Uh, and one of the things that is, you know, it's like... You were saying, Jonathan, what, I forget what it was in philosophy, uh, inferential... Inference to the best explanation. Yeah, I mean, the extraordinary thing is that um, when birds... I mean, the whole process of roosting is cultural. And, and when they're going to the roost, um, it, it's often quite plodding and, and functional behaviour, but they love high wind. I mean, when it's really, really windy... I mean, we went one time and it blew my friend's glasses off his head. And the birds are extraordinarily excited. I mean, they vocalise a lot when they're roosting anyway because it's an intensely social experience. But in high wind, there is so much playfulness in their behaviours. And they swoop and swirl around, you know. And, of course, that's what would happen in a windy condition. So it is, you know, natural that it would be more energetic when it's windy. But there's no question <coughs> that... Or, or it seems to me that there's, there's an intensity of behaviour, particularly in the vocalisation and the way in which they're flying, which is about, woo, you know, <laughs> really enjoying the wind. So I, I have a sense of birds enjoying it. And there was a question, I think, from the middle of the row behind. Hi. Um, I had a question about intelligence, because you were talking about that, um, and the comparison between great apes and corvids, for example. So what strikes me about this is that it seems that all the animals that are studied in terms of intelligence are always very social animals. So do you think that intelligence is something that evolves only in animals that have some kind of social behavior? Or do you know any counter example or examples of really lonely type animals that are very intelligent or very social animals that aren't? So it's a really interesting question about, you know, it, it seems that most of the animals that have been studied that seem to have <coughs> higher levels of intelligence than the rest are typically large-brained, long-lived, and as you say, highly social. And so the question is, is it something about being a social animal that... Um, might select for this kind of intelligence. And in fact, I think the first people to really propose this idea that it, it's, it's the sociability or the trials and tribulations of living in a complex social life that drives intelligence were Alison Jolly and then Nick Humphrey in their social function of intellect hypothesis. And initially, of course, they um, explained this in terms of primate life, that they... In looking at different primates, they felt that primates weren't necessarily better than other animals in the physical world. It was really in the social worlds that they excelled. And that's become one of the most dominant um, theories about why we're so intelligent and why only certain animals are highly social. However, <coughs> it's quite interesting that... Some of the cephalopods, the octopus and giant squid, also seem to be quite intelligent. Now, I said seem, not are, because I don't think enough experiments have been done yet. In other words, the jury is out as to whether this is really true. But certainly, of the animals that require a home office license that are invertebrates, 
the cephalopods, the squid and the octopus are the only one that require a home office licence. And there have been studies of social learning in solitary octopus. And there have been studies showing that, that the squid, like the jays and the chimpanzees, can remember the what, where and when of past events. People haven't done that many studies yet. In fact, it's one of the ways in which my lab is going, is now looking at some of these um, <coughs> octopus and squid. Mm. But if it turns out that they really are as intelligent as the corvids, dolphins, chimpanzees and parrots, then that would be a, a real challenge for this social theory. Alternatively, it may turn out that although they appear <coughs> to be very good at certain things, perhaps there are limitations. And that's, I think, mm. the power of science, really, is it allows us to ask these kinds of questions mm. and then collect sufficient evidence to mm. assess them, rather than just relying on intuitive hunches. There's a very good example in... Um in the animal that's closest to us because dogs are far less intelligent than wolves. And one of the interesting things is that wild wolves, because they live in a social environment, unlike dogs, or dogs are living in an interspecific environment, often interacting with humans. But it's often uh, it's claimed that wolves are far more intelligent and show problem solving and show much, you know, much more, um, look like much more intelligent animals. And there's a situation where they're living in intensely sociable groups and the dog is essentially a, often a very solitary creature. Yeah, I think the other problem of course with dogs is the domestication mm -hmm. argument and people have done certain studies where they've, sh in unrelated animals, showing that um, domestication seems to lead to decreased cognition and mm -hmm. decreased mm -hmm. brain size. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They're just couch potatoes basically. <laughs> <laughs> And a question from the uh, front row here. How long do they live for? Well, it and do they use the same nest each year, or do they have to make new ones all the time? How long do birds, birds live? Well, it depends on the species, but interestingly, crows are very long-lived. So my scrub jays, which are only about 80 to 100 grams, so they're a really small corvid, my oldest ones live to be 22 years of age. Now, the textbooks say that the average lifespan of a scrub jay is four to nine years. But of course, that means in the wild as a result of predation. But in Cambridge's Corvid Palace, they lived to be 22. And most of them died of old age related diseases. So they get things like cataracts and memory loss and all those things that. <laughs> old people get to or some old people anyway um, and it's it's thought that that some of the bigger corvids can live to be say 40 years mm. so quite old there's an interesting characteristic of corvids that they do live a long time but that um it was believed in classical times that they were the longest lived animal on earth or something you know lived for 150 years so they had a hierarchy of long-lived animals i think stags were one of them it was completely um, seemed, you know, without any evidence, but corvids were thought to be the longest lived, yeah. which is interesting. And they use the same nest each year? Well, it depends on the species, but, um, but my experience is, of course, the, 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 the stock presumption is, because in the case of rooks, that they have the same nest site every year. In other words, they use a rookery, um, and some of the rook nests persist that therefore they're just adding to the nest each year. And in some cases that does happen. But my experience is that sometimes as little as 0% of nests survive the winter. So they're often blown down and they build it again. But they, they can have nests that survive for very long periods, particularly in trees that are very sheltered. And, and then it becomes very problematic actually to census them because the nests just accumulate like a great tenement. And in the end, you know, it's this great fortress of twigs extending across the trees and um, and those nests I assume are extremely old yeah and you often see them in sort of what October time repairing the nests don't you when there are bits of nests that have, haven't been blown down but aren't kind of as robust as they would like you see yeah. them doing a lot of repair in the autumn and then they go full gamut and nest building again in the spring 
Yeah, my experience is that they usually do it in the spring, but um, definitely some nests survive and they tinker with them and etc. Yeah. And Nikki, I mean, was it an emotionally difficult experience for you to see the decline of these birds? You've talked about your personal bond with them. It must be a sad thing when they decline oh, and die. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get so upset when a bird dies. And in fact, when I got my... Um, job in Cambridge, I was still in California at the time, and the head of the psychology department said, um, well, what, you know, what's negotiating power, what, what do you need um, to accept this offer? Mm. And I said, there's one thing. I said, well, actually, there's 25 things. Said, 25? Mm. I said, well, it depends how you look at it, whether it's one or 25, really, but I've got 25 scrub jays, and I'm not leaving without them so it's either <laughs> one human lectureship and 25 avian lectureships or no nikki clayton and i became known as nikki and the jays it sounded like a pop group <laughs> you could do so, the dancing. i know yeah right so there'll be more time for for your questions a bit later but we also want to talk about mark's work and and mark i mean you also share with Nikki this fascination with the crows in particular. You've come to this from a very different direction. Yeah. You tell us how your fascination with crows got started. Well, um, my, particularly with crows, but my, my interest in the cultural significance of birds um, came about because um, I write articles for The Guardian and um, I always wanted something to write about and I got sick of just writing the sort of biological facts and I became more interested in what we assumed existed between the ears of, an, of a bird and the meanings we poured into them and the kinds of ways in which we've projected value onto them. Um, so that became a way of, 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 writing, um, of writing this column, which, uh, which I've written for 30 years, The Guardian, and The Guardian Weekly as well. And I often had, uh, there was a period when I was writing 52 articles a year. And my, the, the, the communist... Um, remark in our household was, oh shit, I've got another country diary to write. So, so this cultural significance of birds became a way of, of talking about something which I thought was, um, in the end, more fascinating to me. But my particular interest in corvids grew out of, um, as I say, living in Claxton. And um, I just happened to, and we'd moved into the house, and I'd hear these corvids, rumbustious great flocks passing overhead in my sleep. And um, it, they come over at dawn, and it, and, it, and it gradually dawned on me. There was this extraordinary movement of corvids happening every morning in winter. And I thought, oh, I must go down to see what the hell is happening. Where are they coming from? What are they doing? And um, yes, I went down a quarter of a mile from our house, 15 minutes, 20 minutes down onto the marsh. And I saw this extraordinary cavalcade of birds converging on a wood. And... Um, and, and uh, I saw it and went to visit it several times. And one of the interesting things about being an author is finding the moment when the book congeals as an idea. And I looked across at this extraordinary amoeba, about a kilometre long of corvids roiling in the sky, this extraordinarily beautiful unfolding dance, if you like, by the birds at last light. And I thought, there's a book in this. And, and so... <laughs> The difficult part was convincing my editor, who, who's, who I've just seen today, Dan Franklin, and he's a publisher of Ian McEwan and people like that. And um, I, th I thought, I'm going to try and tell him I'm going to do a book on rooks. And, the, and, I, and, and I said, Dan, I want to write a book about rooks. And rooks, of course, one of the conceits of the book is it's one of the most commonplace, ordinary birds. And, um, and he went, doesn't say many words, Dan, but he went, rooks. <laughs> it sounds a bit like a rook, actually. He went, rooks. I love rooks, and I knew I was in, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's a study of, I mean, I was interested in what Nikki was saying about the pandanus leaves on the, on the Caledonian crow, um, because this phenomenon that I describe is a roost. It only occurs in the winter. It breaks down as soon as the first egg is laid in the nest. They, they, they um, start to incubate as soon as the first egg is in the nest, so the, the eggs hatch. Uh, asynchronously, they don't all hatch together like most songbirds, and um, and this is to do with their particular feeding behaviour. But 
but, but, the, but the roost occurs for about six months of the year. And what I started to unravel was this bit of behaviour with corvids, which is essentially a cultural phenomenon. And, um, and I think that's interesting in itself, the fact that Nikki said, you know, the, pand the, the new Caledonian crows have different cultures in different parts of the island. <coughs> essentially, the learned behaviour of how to con cut the pandanus leaf out it is something learnt, and it's different in different parts of the island. Uh, and the very idea that we are now using this word cultural about an animal seems to me a very important uh, key development in what we've called loosely anthropomorphism. Because, you know, we always assumed, because of, you know, the, the, the great Cartesian uh, <coughs> split between humans and the rest of life, that we alone had this power of cognition. I think, therefore, I am, and no other animal had this. That was the assumption of Descartes. And I think it's very important that we are now beginning to project onto um, corvids and other creatures a cultural life, you know, j wolves especially, and et cetera, et cetera. But the extraordinary thing about corvids is the persistence. And you were saying, um, you were asking the question, you know, how long did they build their nest? Well, we have very little um, solid scientific evidence on how long these nests persist, but we do know that they last at least 400 years. So we have uh, rookeries that have been persistently used by a community of birds over hundreds of years. And of course, that's to do with the sparsity of the evidence for birds. So they could have been there for thousands of years. And one of the interesting things to me is that the roost has no physical characteristics. The birds don't construct any nests. It's, it's a non-breeding wood. It's a wood in which rooks don't nest. But what, what we have found is that roosts only exist where there can be ghost rookeries. So at some <coughs> point, there will have been a, a rook nesting community in a roost. Do you get the difference? A rookery is where they breed in the spring, they abandon that in June, and then the roost is where they spend their winters, starting from June sometimes, but it builds up throughout the autumn and, and reaches a kind of crescendo in February. But the, the, the cultural life of roosts could be, theoretically, I mean, the village next to me is called Rockland St. Mary, and Rockland means rook grove. So rooks have been very, and we've named the place after rooks, uh, and, and the only woods where the birds do roost are the, the, the bits of ancient woodland in our valley. So um, what was fascinating was there was absolutely no evidence, no ornithologist had ever looked at a rook. Um, they're sort of kind of overlooked. You know, the commonplace birds are, 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 are ignored. And what I found fascinating was that there's this extraordinary phenomenon, 40,000 birds the rooks and jackdaws from an area of 400 square kilometers, roosting in one place, draining during the course of the day, spending an hour to converge on this roost side. So if you can imagine, the winter day is only six to eight hours, and they spend um, an hour of every day, theoretically a real bottleneck in terms of feeding opportunities since daylight is it's, it's a diurnal bird and daylight is short, Yet an hour of every day is, is, is devoted to this cultural moment, which is exactly what it is. It's a, it's a collection of birds. No one really knows why Corvid's roost. There's been fascinating work done on ravens, um, which tends to suggest it's about feeding behavior. But I think there are multiple purposes to the roost. And I, I just found this absolutely fascinating. And, and the, the conceit of the book is to make the commonplace magical. That's what it's mm. seeking to do. So I, you know, I could have written a book about Lady Amherst pheasant or something incredibly beautiful, but I wanted to write something about something forsaken and mundane to show that life is magical and mm. the very ordinariness of it was a very important part of it. Even these very everyday birds have incredibly rich cultural lives. Well, mm. and have a cultural yeah. life, you know, yeah. But, yeah. but not just a cultural life. You know, I started to think about who owns this landscape? You know, this very idea that we have of ownership of landscapes. That there's a village called R R Rockland, and that community is itself named after rooks. So, so pres and, and presumably these roosts can persist for 
hundreds, if not thousands of years. So human culture is in a way shaped by the yes. culture of the it's Christ. It's the interaction between the two, which I think is absolutely fascinating. But, but you know, I'm particularly interested in, in the false ideas that exist between, um, between our ears about birds. But I think, I think what's interesting is um, how birds have always been important measures of uh, the ways in which we conduct our lives. So, for example, the word auspex, which was the name for the Roman seer, who would be consulted um, on state matters, as a famous description in the first, um, first war, Carthaginian War in Rome, and one of the famous generals was, was going, to, um, going into battle, and he said, you know, let's... Let's do the birds and see what you know how my how it's going to turn out. And the chickens were got out, and the auspex said, "Oh no, don't go into battle." Whatever his name was, I can't remember now. And <laughs> and he said, "Well, if they won't eat corn, let them eat, let them drink, let them eat salt." And he threw them overboard, and 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 so went on to massive defeat. And I think it's it's the very idea that Roman political life could be based on flight behaviours of birds, which seems to me interesting and is mm. continuing to be significant. Um, just to give one small example, the, the Labour Party, do you remember them in the uh, eons ago, um, before Brexit and Trump and blah, blah, blah. Um, they had several measures of the quality of life, and one of those qualities of life measures was bird populations. Um, they instituted the measure and then promptly, totally ignored it. But I think it's interesting <laughs> that birds should find a place in our cultural and political discourse that tells us something about our own experience and something about the health of our own society, etc. And, and I think, you know, one of the fascinating things for me, because I'm a complete fraud here, I know nothing about the cognition of birds, it should be Nathan who sat in this chair <laughs> with, with Nikki. But what I find fascinating is that we have a language that is talking about culture, that is looking into the mindfulness of birds, that is projecting the theory of mind onto birds, that is seeing corvids as intelligent as primates, that, that this is all happening at a time of biological crisis. So, so you know, Nikki's instinctive vegetarianism um, runs absolutely flush with how we could possibly manage this planet to retain this huge human population, but also sustain some of the biodiversity we've got. So, so you know, I find it fascinating that birds are playing a part in shaping our discourse about life uh, and are not necessarily because we understand them, though in the case of, of Nikki and, and Nathan, they do understand it, and it's shaping our sensitivities to birds. But one of the things I was saying earlier to you was that um, uh, our attitudes towards corvids, I mean, Nikki and Nathan are changing through this uh, extraordinary research that's exposing the intelligence of these birds. Not a single member of the EU, none of the 28 countries, has any legal protection for any of the corvids. Mm. And on average, per year, we are slaughtering 20 million crows in Europe. I mean, the, the, the calculation is, is completely arbitrary because the, no one's keeping records. The Americans have an extraordinarily um, violent relationship with corvids. There was a fantastic description of a roost of American crows in Texas where... They were, you know, of course everyone was armed. It was America, well, it was Texas. And they were literally shooting them out of the sky. And the language they used for that experience was, was Old Testament. You know, it was this, they, they were shooting the heck out of them. We don't know whether we're having any effect. But our grandfathers, I mean, one of the newspaper reports was our, grandpa, our grandfathers cut civilization out of this wilderness and we ain't going to give it up to a load of crows. And I think it's fascinating how dark corvids are um, for us. And the only country that offers them any legal protection is Australia. And, and, and you know, we're, we're essentially slaughtering primates. I mean, Nikki, would you like to come in on this? You must have thought a lot about the legal and moral standing of these birds while working with them. Yeah, um, 
I think the per people's perception is a fascinating area because I remember there was a, a program, an RSPB uh, census done, I think, for people to say five most popular and five least popular birds. And the, the crows, I think, were the most hated or mm. least popular. Yeah. But the jay was one of the most popular, mm -hmm. even though it's a corvid. Um, it does, mm. It's just as naughty as a crow. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's brightly coloured, it's all right. It, 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 we don't like mm, black coloured yeah, birds. Yeah. We, f we are worried about them. They, they, they make us suspicious. We associate the black colouring as evil. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that, that this, this cr chromatic um, gradient that we have, this moral, this moral gradient that's associated with colour, doesn't function in other societies. So, for instance, the Indians who associate death with white. Um, have very strong rituals associated with honouring their grandparents and, and ancestors through feeding corvids. Um, and what's fascinating for me is um, uh, this relationship that uh, Native Americans, particularly and Asian communities, had with ravens. And I find this fascinating because one of their myths, one of their kind of culture gods is the raven played an extraordinary part in the Pacific Northwest of the USA with five tribes. I can't pronounce it, but I'll try it. It's the Simshian, Haida, and uh, Kling, 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 Klingi. Those communities, that six communities, I think, who have, whose five languages are, 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 have some characteristic relationships, but they are as different from one another as Japanese, Persian, um, I can't remember now, but, you know, Russian. They're extraordinary Finnish and, you know, another language, but, but English. So they're remarkably complex societies, and they attributed um, the foundation of part of their, the fact that the, 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 the raven gave them sunlight, the raven gave them the Milky Way. What I find fascinating is that, as Nikki was saying, Corvids um, plant billions of tree seeds, the whole of the northern taiga forests of Eurasia and North America are essentially managed by jays that um, Nikki um, has observed caching. In the case of jays, it's yeah. 5,000 acorns. And in the case of nutcrackers, I thought it was 100,000, but you say 33,000. 33, well, let's not yeah. argue. Tens yeah, of thousands. It's, it's a lot, isn't it? Tens of thousands <laughs> of spruce and hazelnut seeds. And though their memories, their, their extraordinary memory capacity to remember these uh, tree seeds, they don't remember them all. And in fact, jays will continue feeding on acorns when the acorn itself has sprouted. I have five acres in Norfolk. And I have a single oak tree that is, you know, half a mile from the nearest oak tree. It's almost certainly planted by a jay. And when I used to have an allotment, I would be rummaging through my allotment and I would find acorns sprouting and buried by jays in the soil. So, so these birds, and they also choose sites that are distant from, <coughs> um, from other trees. So they don't, they, don't, they don't bury them underneath trees, they bury them in open space. And of course, that is the area that is most likely to give rise to new trees. So if we think of corvids across at a hemispheric level, millions and millions of corvids burying billions of seeds across the continents, they are truthfully husbanding the forests of the northern hemisphere to, as climate change takes effect, presumably into, you know, on, on a century's time scale. And, and so therefore the very idea that the raven um, gave us sunlight or brought life starts to acquire some genuine meaning. You know, these birds play an extraordinary role in the management of habitats. And I find that, you know, moving and affecting. In my, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say there's that lovely story of in the folklore of the Scandinavians. Do you know the Hugin and Munin one? Oh, yes, the raven was memory and thought. That's right, yeah, yeah the god Odin. Uh, the, and yes, he had his two ravens, and he yes. would send, send them off yeah. to go and be spies, essentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, very interesting. Well, of course, you know, if, you know, we've only got to investigate the Christian or Judeo-Christian tradition of, you know, the very fact that Noah found land because of a bird. So you start to find the ways in which birds have played fundamental roles in, 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 in the ways in which humans think about life. And, and crows play a particular role, but they, they have a very dark role um, and a negative role. So, for instance, um, in the 17th century, in the Cromwellian period, a jackdaw flew around the chamber in the Houses of Parliament and um, <coughs> business was suspended because it was such a terrible omen. <laughs> Ravens were assumed to spread the plague. And then in the foot and mouth outbreak in the 1950s, it was assumed that starlings were spreading foot and mouth. So our ideas that certain birds that are very successful and often flock and often show intelligence um, are despised in the Western tradition. And I think it's fantastic, first of all, that Nikki and Nathan are changing not only our scientific grasp, but also our moral understanding of our relationship with these creatures, you know. It, it, and there was a fascinating story of uh, a, a mutual friend of Nikki and mine, is called Tim Burkett, mm -hmm. and he did, he, he, he was at the time that he wrote his book on the magpie, the world's leading expert on magpies, and he went to a group of northern bird keepers, I think, and they said, well, Mr. Burkett, are you going to tell us about the, the magpie? And what Tim's research had shown is that Magpies, though blamed for the decimation of songbirds, um, because everyone's seen a magpie. And in fact, I once saw a jay in the middle of London hauling sparrows <laughs> out of a <laughs> nest. So when Nikki says they're naughty, they really are. Anyway, this group of people listened to Tim, and Tim said, there is absolutely no scientific evidence um, that magpies are having an impact on songbird populations. In fact, in the areas where magpie populations were increasing, so were the songbirds as well. And to a man, they all sat there and went, well, Mr. Burkett, we hear what you say, but we don't believe a word of it, do we? And they all, sh you know, unanimously <laughs> shouted that this was totally untrue. And, and I think it's a wonderful example of the triumph of myth and yeah. historical perceptions of birds over science. It raises yeah. this interesting question of the relationship mm. between science and yeah. personal experience and anecdotes. I mean, we've got this idea from you, Mark, that the myths can actually be very bad, and we need science sometimes to correct the myths we have about these birds. Does it sometimes, I wonder, go the other way? I mean, are there things we can actually learn about birds from personal experience that we can't learn from science? Well, I was going to tackle it a slightly different way first, if I may, which is where a myth has inspired research about science. Mm. Mm. If I may just give one example yeah, of that yeah. first. Which is the, the crow and the pitcher, the Aesop's fable. And in this Aesop's fable, there's a thirsty crow, and the crow encounters a pitcher of water. And the water level in the jug is too low, so the bird can't mm. manage to reach the water. And it puts stones into the jug to raise the water level and can therefore have a drink. And of course everybody called it a fable. This, this was entire fiction. But of course in the work that Nathan and I have done, testing whether corvids, and in the first instance rooks, and then jays, and then New Caledonian crows, could actually do what the myth was claiming. And we found, sure enough, they can, they will use stones to raise the water level. Now, in our case, we don't make the crows thirsty. There's no need to be cruel to them. All we have to do is place a little waxworm on the top of the water. Now, waxworms are the Belgian triples of the Corvid world. They absolutely love them. <laughs> so if you give them a, a jug or a tube of water, the level's too low, and there's a worm floating on the top, they will spontaneously put stones in the water to raise the water mm -hmm. level. And in fact, they even know to put ones that sink and not ones that float in. And that's when I alluded earlier to tasks that children don't pass till they're eight. That's an example mm. of a task children don't pass till they're eight. So that's interesting from the other way around, because that's where a myth has actually in, not informed science, but inspired science. Mm. Yeah. And turned out to be true. And turned out to be true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Shall we take some more questions from yeah. the audience yeah. then? Great. Uh, great to see so many questions. Please wait for the 
microphone to come to you. Let's start in the second row here. Hi, thank you so much for the really interesting discussion. Um, I was wondering about the definition of intelligence because it seems that within the experiments we're discussing, although some talk about caching food, etc., and more natural behaviours, I wonder what you think about how much we're restricting our knowledge of animals by asking them questions that are based on human intelligence and what we deem to be intelligent. Well, it's a it's a difficult thing, isn't it? Because we can't be anything other than Ourself. anthropocentric. Yes, yeah. how, how can we possibly? know any other individual than ourselves. I mean, we, we struggle even to understand the consciousness as another human being, mm -hmm. never mind a, a totally different animal. So on the one hand, it would be great if there was some way of knowing what other kinds of intelligence were out there that we could test. So I think all we can do is, is try to look at the kinds of tasks that we think require some sort of complex cognition, some sort of complex problem solving, as opposed to something that's just hardwired, mm -hmm. so uh, innate, or something that can simply be learned by trial and error. So the reason that, for example, I shared the memory um, station rooks with you was because it takes them 20 pulls before they even get a piece of food. Whereas in a simple trial and error task, normally it would be one action it leads to a reward, right, I'll do that again. Another action, it doesn't lead to a reward, I won't do that. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't be thinking about other things, but it's difficult to know where to start. You know, there are people that will sort of say, well, all animals are equally intelligent. They're all adapted to the environment in which they live. That's intelligent. Now, if that's how you want to define it, then fair enough. But I think if you really want to understand thought processes, that sort of definition isn't very helpful because it doesn't tell you, doesn't provide any way of trying to get at, under the nitty gritty of how does it work? How might it be solving the problem? How might it be thinking whether it is a dog, a chimpanzee, a crow, a child, an adult human? So I, suppose, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's... Yes, and I think it's also, I mean, what we also have to look at is the background to this, which is this, this Cartesian idea that we have, that, you know, dumb animals can be treated in any way we like. Uh, and, and I suppose it is a both, uh, you know, we're so now requiring of science to, to prove things, to challenge our deep-seated ancient prejudices about other species, that any... Attribution or ascription of intelligence to other animals <laughs> is um, any imaginative encounter, any projection of the sense of wonder and, 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 and extraordinariness to other animals is an important moral process in its own right. And you know, intelligence takes many forms. I mean, black bar-tail godwits fly from Alaska, um, a bird weighing one pound flies non stop from Alaska across the Pacific Ocean to New Zealand. It's the longest flight, continuous flight, by a, by a non-seabird. So the bartail godwit loses half its body mass, and it flies to New Zealand. Imagine flying yourself across <laughs> the emptiness of millions of square miles of ocean, and you arrive on an island as small as New Zealand. No wonder they ring the bells in Christchurch Cathedral. Because it is astonishing. I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily intelligence in the sense of cognitive, but you know, it is a kind of knowing of the of the world and and, and their place in the world, and it, it leaves you with a sense of awe. And I think it's even that kind of information can change uh, the ways in which we understand the extraordinariness of birds and and start to diminish this uh, this obsessive privileging of ourselves and our own intelligence. So I think your idea that. You know, the only thing we can really measure is our is birds' reflections of our own intelligence is an interesting one in its own right. Mm. Okay, let's take a further question um, from further a few rows further back. Thank you. Hello, I was wondering whether birds exhibit hostile behaviour when it's not connected to food or protecting themselves. Are they mean just for the sake of being mean? <laughs> <laughs> There are certainly in the folklore, there are stories 
um, of rooks in terms of the parliament of rooks. <laughs> you know this one, though, where supposedly if a bird has been badly behaved and its um, flock members disapprove, that the bird is actually being punished. Now, experiments haven't been done in that way scientifically, <laughs> but I did have a jackdaw in our group. We had a big aviary of rooks and jackdaws, and we don't know what crime um, Conrad Lorenz, as he was called, committed. <laughs> <laughs> Nazi, was it? <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether this jackdaw was, you know, exhibiting related behaviours. But the, the rest of the jackdaws and rooks in that group converted Conrad Lawrence into essentially a miniature bald-headed eagle. Right. In other words, they it stripped him all of his head feathers. Gosh. And if we hadn't rescued him and kept him inside until he grew his feathers back, he would have surely died mm. just from all the heat loss. Do you know this story? Do you know the you know story the of the Parliament? Well, it's, if you buy a copy of Birds Britannica, <laughs> <laughs> which you could from Amazon only for £30 for this Christmas, um, there's a fantastic drawing by a guy who lived in Cambridge who submitted, it, people submitted stories to me and he drew what he thought was um, a rook parliament that he claimed to see in the 1930s. And also, uh, I remember my father telling me a story of, um, of one of his friends claiming to see it. And in fact, I just got a letter the other day from Australians, two Australian old boys living in Tasmania, and thought they'd seen this behaviour amongst Tasmanian crows. And, and, you know, the birds stand in a circle around the accused. And then, according to the judgment, um, the bird is either pecked to death and then... You know, the, the witness goes back an hour later and finds, you know, the sad mortal remains of the convicted criminal um, at the court site, or it's acquitted and it flies away. And, you know, this, uh, this, this ascription of moral qualities to, I suppose it's, it's kind of a, a, an interesting... Um, I think what it shows is one of the fundamental characteristics of portraits is that they have been... Um, accorded human qualities for a very long time and I think it's fascinating that here's a case of of a myth that has been proven because you know science is slowly catching up and proving the fact that these birds do have you know extraordinary um, intelligent behaviors that look like humans no it takes a thief to to catch a thief and all those yeah. kinds of things. And it's one of the last holdouts of human exceptionalism, right, that we, okay, tool use, that's not unique. Yeah. But maybe morality, maybe yeah. the ability to be moral agents yeah. is uniquely human. Yeah. This story is challenging even that. I mean, what yeah. do you think, Nikki? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's fascinating. And as I say, we've no idea, it, it, even in the lab, what went on with this mm. poor jackdaw. Mm, it's very interesting. Clearly, something had gone on. Um, and I, I suppose mm. it's, you know, slowly but surely we're trying to think of ways in which we can investigate some of these issues scientifically. We've got time for a couple more questions. Let's have one from the front row here. Thank you. I suppose um, one of the great human fantasies has been the ability wanting to fly from the days of Icarus. And oddly enough, what it says, I've had dreams where I've been like a drone in the sky. And people said to me, anyone can fly. You, all you need is willpower, and you can do it anyway. There we go. The, but you mentioned the persecution of birds by human beings. And there's a very interesting film by Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds, where the boot, boot is on the other foot and the birds start to take over, which is very... We never know what the end result is going to be. The film, the, the birds... You mean we don't know the ending of that film, what the end will be? It's kind yes, of yes, yes. It's left um, up in the air. Um, I've, you mentioned uh, birds that migrate for very long distances. I wondered whether, th did, do they migrate because they think, oh, it's getting warmer. It's time I 
went to, to Europe and England? Or, or is it, you know, is it just instinct that tells them that there's no cognition as such? Well, I think um, these are very, well, I mean, presumably the migration behaviors have, have happened in waves according to the passage and movement of Ice Age conditions across Eurasia but, um, and, and North America, but, um, but, but these are very old behaviors, and the birds are instinctively imprinted to, to pursue these behaviors. You probably know a bit more about There's, science. There was a, yeah, there was a very interesting series of experiments that was done quite a long time ago now in at one of the Max Planck Institutes of Ornithology in, in Germany. It was mm -hmm. black, cat, um, black cat warblers, and um, by Peter Berthold and his colleagues. And they had, so for a start, there are some species of black cat warblers that migrate, and there are other species of black cat warblers that don't. Mm -hmm. And they took ones that migrated, and they had two strains, one that migrated southwest and one that migrated southeast. And you can measure the migratory orientation by putting a little hundred bird on it. And as it gets into the migratory mode, which is often um, triggered by the day, day length, mm -hmm. you, you can have a sort of funnel at the top of its cage. And, and where it's kind of jumping up is marked on the funnel. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can mark its orientation. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that when they interbred, ones that went southwest with ones that went southeast, the hybrids migrated due south. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a beautiful example of, of strong genetic control of the migratory orientation mm -hmm. of the birds. But I think that's the only yeah. one, one of the inter to know. One of the interesting characteristics is that um, black, bird pop uh, black cat populations have increased by about 400% in Europe, across Europe. Um, but in the 1950s, German and Polish Central European blackbirds, black caps, started turning up on winter bird tables in the UK. Oh yes. And um, that behaviour now has strengthened, and um, that random bit of behaviour by a small subset has actually been very successful because the journey is much less, their migration time is less, the hazards that they encounter, the security of the food supplies in the winter for the black caps, and um, they've looked at um, the blackbirds' close investigation of their DNA, and they're already starting to diverge from the southward migrating black cat population. So there's a classic example where a bit of, a bit of random behavior, and I suppose a, a, an indication of natural selection, where yeah. it's successful and, and then genetic modification has, has yeah. followed, which natural is extraordinary. Natural selection the action, yeah. 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 Fantastic. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. My apologies to those of you who had a question that didn't get a chance to ask it. But let's thank Mark and Nikki for really fascinating. <laughs>